You're listening to Willpower, an Optimal Living interview with Roy Baumeister and Brian Johnson. Hi, this is Brian. Welcome back to the Optimal Living interview series. Today, I'm thrilled to be chatting with Roy Baumeister, who literally wrote the book on willpower, which is the book we're going to focus on today. He has written, at the time he wrote Willpower, over 450 scientific publications. He's one of the world's most cited psychologists. And uh, as you know, if you listen to much of this stuff, willpower and the Greek idea of arete is one of my favorite concepts. And I'm truly just thrilled and honored to be chatting with you, Roy, and I appreciate you taking the time. I'm glad to be here. Thanks, Brian. Well, the subtitle of willpower is Rediscovering the Greatest Human Strength. Can you talk to us about uh, what willpower is and why it's the greatest human strength? Uh, well, yes, uh, willpower is the, uh, the capacity or the, the energy that enables you to change what you're doing. Uh, I think of the, the simplest uh, psych- uh, psychological part of self-control as just overriding one response to do something else, whether it's um, an, an impulse that you uh, restrain or changing your emotional state, uh, better or worse, or uh, making your uh, controlling your thoughts so that you focus on what you're doing, or, um, or remain uh, concentrated, or whatever, um, or also regulating your performance, or to try to uh, make yourself keep going when you're tired, to uh, find the right balance between working fast and working uh, carefully. Um, performing up to your capabilities. All these things, uh, I think, are important. Now, uh, as to why it's the, the greatest human strength, uh, uh, John Tierney, the New York Times writer, I had the good luck to be uh, working with on that book. I mean, that, that was a phrase he came up with. And I, um, as a scientist, I thought, well, we, we, we got to uh, justify that. But I think uh, you can make a good case that uh, that it is. It's one of the keys to the success of human culture, which is uh, uh, how our, our species solves the problems of survival and reproduction by uh, creating these uh, these fancy social structures. But they only work if most of the people follow the rules most of the time. And um, you have to uh, respect others' property and do your job and pay your bills and so forth. And and then it and then it works, and everyone's better off. But but force a culture to work or a great deal of self-control is required. Sometimes I have people do a thought experiment to imagine, uh, well, suppose they took an ape or a gorilla and uh, gave it a place in the human world and gave it a, a job and a car and an apartment and so on. You know, it, it really wouldn't work out. And uh, it, it, it's probably its inability to bring its behavior in line with the rules of society um, that, that would fall apart. If, if we all have enough self-control to kind of do our bit, then we, we have all this marvelous progress of, of, of civilization. So in that sense, it's the greatest human strength. Um, another salient comparison for me is uh, I'd started off my career uh, uh, doing research on self-esteem. And, uh, you know, we initially were all quite taken with the idea that if we could improve people's self-esteem, it would solve a lot of uh, individuals and society's problems. And uh, there was very tempting evidence for this because low self-esteem is uh, correlated with all sorts of uh, bad outcomes, whether it's uh, drug addiction or uh, a victimization or, or, or whatever. Um, but uh, over time, it gradually emerged that self-esteem is really a result. It's not a cause. So uh, and it's just tempting in the schools that, uh, yeah, kids who do bad in school have a little bit worse self-esteem. So I thought, well, if we could raise their self-esteem, maybe it will cause them to do better in school. But it doesn't. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, it's, it's Doing well in school leads to higher self-esteem, but it doesn't work in, in reverse so well. Uh, looks like you really have to do the math problems after all, yeah. uh, rather than just believe that you're great at, uh, at it. So um, with some disappointment and reluctance, a lot of us kind of gave up on self-esteem, but self-control uh, seems like the real thing. It's much more uh, powerful in terms of actually producing benefits down the road. That's what I tell teachers and parents and so on, if you want the best for the, uh, the youngsters, uh, forget about self-esteem and concentrate on self-control. It's better for them and better for society. Uh, there's more evidence of this coming out all the time. People with good self-control 
uh, do better in work. They do better at school. They're also more popular. They have better relationships. Other people like them better. Um, they're healthier. Both mental and physical health improves with uh, higher self-control. Um, make more money in life. Uh, fewer behavioral problems. And and at the far end, you actually live longer. Um, um, pe- people with uh, high self-control have significantly longer uh, uh, greater longevity, which uh, is one of the gold standards for health outcomes, of course. Uh, so it's, it's really what's not to love there. Um, <laughs> uh, the other way I put it sometimes is uh, psychologists really found two traits that uh, seem to predict success in life in every place they've been tested. And, and one is intelligence uh, and the other is self-control. Uh, we've been trying to increase intelligence for decades and it doesn't seem like there's a lot that can be done there in any lasting way. You can give kids a head start and so on, but that seems to fade out as soon as the programs end. Uh, but self-control does uh, at least seem that you can improve it in, uh, in a somewhat more lasting way. And uh, we're looking you know, for um, bigger, more ambitious studies to be done to uh, to verify this. But it, it, uh, that, that's part of what's exciting to me is that understanding self-control really offers uh, a serious promise so uh, for how we could help people live uh, better, happier, healthier lives. Yeah, that's really exciting. Is is it true? I think it was Martin Seligman who said something along the lines of uh, self-control or willpower outpredicts IQ by a factor of two for academic performance. Is that uh, is that accurate? Uh, he did he did have one study showing that uh, uh, it's it's hard to make a a, a, a sweeping statement that strong. We, I think need a lot more data, but uh, but but Dr. Selman is, uh, is 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 certainly right. Uh, the evidence does suggest that self control uh, is stronger than intelligence. I mean, ideally, uh, you want to have some of both, but uh, <laughs> uh, but it, it's ironic. You know, our measures of intelligence were designed to predict who's going to do well in school, I and mean, that's what IQ testing is basically for. And so, for uh, for him and others to come along with a self control measure and say, well, look, this actually predicts better uh, than, the IQ, uh, than the IQ measure for predicting how kids do in school, uh, that's really quite amazing. Hmm. And exciting because we can all build our self-control, right? In a, in yes, I, uh, I, I, I think so. Yes, I believe that. And uh, uh, so, yes, a very promising way forward. Wonderful. Well, I'd love to, to talk about some of those practical ways we can build self-control. Um, one of the phrases that you use with John in the book is, is the people with good self-control use it more for offense than defense. Can you talk to us about that? Yes, this is something that's come up in the last few years. I mean, I've been doing self-control studies since about 1990, so I, uh, <clears throat> I've been working on it and thinking it for a long time, and yet uh, a, a real change in my understanding came just in the last few years. Partly, uh, it was a big project looking at uh, uh, at the, the personality differences, and you know, we all know some people have... Uh, better self-control than others, and we wondered, do they just have more willpower, which was the the, the natural first assumption that, that somehow these people are better at resisting temptation and uh, pushing themselves to do the right thing. And yet, that seems not to be true. They have maybe the same amount of willpower, they just use it more, more effectively. Uh, what we discovered was that uh, people with good self-control it's not that they use it for these uh, heroic acts like working all night or resisting a, a, a huge temptation or something like that. Rather, they use it to, to establish good habits and break bad ones. So they, they set up their life so it kind of runs on automatic pilot and, and kind of gets them where they need to go. I mean, I, we all associate uh, willpower, for example, with uh, dieting and quitting smoking and, and such things. And um, well, sure enough, in the the big uh, compilation of, <clears throat> of all the research results. Yeah, people with good self-control are a little better at those things, but those are small effects. The big effects show up in things uh, where work and school were the, were the biggest ones. And there, uh, it's not, you might think, oh, what do you need great self-control for to do that? It's, well, when you have the paper due tomorrow and you haven't started, you can force yourself to work all night and get it done on time and meet that deadline. I mean, that might feel like a big version of self-control, but that's not what people with good self-control do. Rather, they develop good work habits, get going ahead of the deadline, so they don't find themselves in that position of the reports due tomorrow and I haven't started. 
uh, they get they get going early, and and then it's it's not as stressful. Uh, people with good self control, we're finding all these things. They they have less guilt because they don't they don't screw up as much. Uh, they have less stress in their lives. Um, it, it, it again goes from this is what we call playing offense rather than playing defense. It's just to count on your self control to bail you out of a tight spot. Rather use it offensively. Don't get into a tight spot in the first place, um, and it, it it works also. I mean, I mentioned the work in school examples, but uh, some of the same things in relationships and uh, uh, personal uh, adjustment uh, practices and, and and so on. The uh, um, working through the habits is, as, as I said, it was a basic change in my thinking right about the time we. Uh, wrote that willpower book that I, I, I come to realize that this is uh, what people with good self-control do. It's not necessarily having more willpower. Uh, it's just uh, using it to set your life to run properly. That's really exciting. Using it wisely to, as you said, have your life run on autopilot. Um, you, the book has a ton of ideas in terms of ways we can cultivate our willpower. Uh, I'd love to chat about a few of my favorites and hear your favorites. Um, one of the big ones that you come back to, we actually you start with glucose. I think that was one of the first things that you mentioned. Um, maybe we'll start there, eating your way to willpower. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, uh, glucose is a chemical in the bloodstream that carries the, uh, the body's energy uh, around and it takes it to the various organs and to the muscles and, and certainly to the brain. Um, and people know the term kind of means sugar, but... Uh, uh, sugar is not really the optimal thing to do for energy. Uh, we actually use it in the laboratory because it has very fast effect. But uh, if you want to eat to improve your your, your uh, self-control, um, you probably want to eat something with a better glycemic index that will, uh, instead of burning, so you get a quick burst of energy and then a crash, get something that will burn over a longer period of time like, uh, like protein. Um, regardless, we, we, uh, stumbled on this somewhat by accident. We were testing a different theory about how self-control works, uh, which, uh, you know, my students said, well, if, if resisting temptation depletes your uh, willpower, maybe giving in to, to, uh, temptation will restore and build your, uh, <laughs> willpower. I, I, I thought, well, I've heard this before. I didn't think it was going to work, but, uh, you know, I said, well, Go ahead and try it. Let's uh, pack some data and see what uh, if we need to uh, revise our theories. And so he ran a study where he first depleted people's willpower. I mean, the, the way we do these uh, is to have them first exert self-control on one task, and then after a while we measure how well they perform self in terms of self-control on a different task. So it doesn't seem like it's the same thing. It's unrelated. And the usual finding is that you know you use up some of your willpower the first one, so you don't do as well on the second one. And in between, uh, uh, Matt Galliott, who was running the study, gave some people ice cream as a treat, and so I got to have them uh, indulge in uh, uh, yielding to temptation, so to speak. And it, it turned out that they're uh, they did improve in self-control, but um, the idea that this was some kind of pleasure that they indulged in that that caused it. It was knocked out by a, another uh, a treatment we ran in the experiment where some people got something to eat that didn't taste very good. Um, but they also showed improvement. And so, well, then I took out the idea that the pleasure was responsible. And Matt was kind of disappointed how oh, the experiment didn't work. But I said, well, look, though, both of these things worked compared to the control group who didn't eat anything. Could, could it just be somehow the food? We've been talking about willpower and self-control energy, uh, but using that as a metaphor, it's like you feel like you have energy or something like that, but you know the body does have actual energy that it gets from food. So we started uh, looking into this, and uh, well, the nutritionists, uh, without a very elaborate theory or anything, they collected lots of data on people who have glucose problems or you know, what happens if you give people more or less, and they built up a fair amount of evidence that uh, made it look like uh, this was there for us to pull together and say, well, I guess when people are having glucose problems, their self-control is down. Even with beautiful studies, like they'll tell a whole uh, class full of students to skip breakfast one day, and then they'll all come in and random assignment, they'll, half the kids will get breakfast and half of them won't. And uh, 
And then what happens that morning? Well, the kids who got breakfast, they learn better and they behave better than the kids who didn't get anything to eat. And then at 10 o'clock or 10.30, when everybody gets a snack, then everything's fine again, and then all the differences vanish. So it really looks like you're, you're going to school without any gas in the tank. You don't have enough energy to uh, fund your self-control, and then you don't behave properly, and you don't concentrate on what the teacher's saying. You don't learn the lessons and, um, uh, and so forth. Anyway, the, the role of glucose, uh, already there was a fair amount there. We did some experiments uh, uh, further to, uh, to to test this too. Now, initially, we uh, thought it was quite simple that uh, well, your, your first act of self-control uses up the glucose in your bloodstream, and that you just don't have enough. That that's not really right. That is not held up. It's a lot more complicated than that. And uh, I suppose we should have known the uh, <laughs> the body is a very complicated uh, system, and it has glucose stored in different places and and so on. You realize how, how important glucose is. It, um, your body is just designed to conserve it uh, whenever it can. And so, you know, these, these willpower depletion effects, these are mostly uh, uh, your body's conserving energy. It's not, it's not running out. It's, it's not in danger. Certainly a modern well-fed citizen of the United States or Western Europe or something is, is in no danger of, uh, of running out of glucose and not having enough fuel for the brain to operate. Um, but the system, you know, we evolved under under conditions where uh, you might not get anything to eat tomorrow, and there might not even be much to eat uh, for the rest of the week. So your your body has to protect its system, and it also it turns out uh, glucose is used a lot by the immune system. That's why the one sign when you start to get sick of things like bother you more, uh, that. Uh, you know, something upsets you more than it should. Well, that could be a sign your your body is taking its uh, uh, energy to fight the illness, and it's not leaving enough for uh, for self control to regulate your emotions as you uh, as you normally do. And and back in evolutionary history, of course, they didn't have antibiotics or medicine or anything. If living outdoors without much in the way of clothes, if you got a cut on your foot or something, <clears throat> it could get infected, and, and that could be life-threatening if your immune system doesn't have the energy to, to fight it. So your your body really evolved to try to preserve and conserve uh, the uh, the glucose energy that it has, and it's, it's the energy that's used for everything. So uh, fortunately, our ancestors evolved the capacity at some point to channel some of that energy into uh, self-control. And, advanced uh, complicated uh, psychological processes uh, mediated by stuff in the brain. Um, so it spares a little, but uh, the same rule is there. It'll use someone it's important and then, and then uh, cut back to conserve. Now, uh, in terms of operating your daily life, uh, well, yes, at the end of the day, you don't resist temptation as well. Your decision-making is also not as good. We, 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 we learned that, uh, a glucose and willpower are also used for making choices and making decisions. Uh, there are some clever studies done to, to show that when people buy a car, they you often have a lot of decisions to make. And uh, as you go on making the decisions, you start more and more to just go with whatever standard because that's the easy uh, sort of the default option. And that can end up costing you a lot of money. Some of the car dealers seem to know this, so they. They start you off choosing the interior fabric or something where you have a hundred different choices and you use up all your decision making energy making those choices and then later on when this when things like rust proofing or whatever that can add a, a hefty chunk of change to the cost of the thing, uh, you're sort of burned out and you say, Yeah, fine, whatever is standard, go do what everybody does and then that, that boosts uh, boosts the price. So when you get to that point, that's where getting a dose of, uh, of glucose uh, might uh, restore your uh, your body and brain to the uh, condition where they're willing to uh, expand and allocate more uh, more glucose again. Um, so take a break. Or I tell the students uh, before the uh, examination, you probably want to have a Coke with real sugar rather than a Diet Coke uh, because... Um, <clears throat> Um, I'm just learning some of this other stuff. Caffeine, you know, does not really give you any more energy. It it just uh, erases the brain signal that you're tired. Uh, the caffeine binds with the molecules that are a byproduct of uh, uh, of using glucose. And so uh, caffeine erases the signal that you're tired. So if you have an old-fashioned Coke, 
uh, or a, you know, a standard. I'm not talking about <laughs> the really old-fashioned kind that used to put cocaine in them, uh, but uh, but the sort of the basic standard Coca-Cola, where you get sugar to get energy and uh, caffeine to erase the feeling of fatigue. That combination would, would get you up. And uh, yeah, again, for best results in an exam, you want to have um, you know a full uh, complement of energy there. Uh, so caffeine alone does not quite do that. It just erases the signal that you're tired, so your body expends more uh, of its energy from its stores, but it doesn't uh, It doesn't really give you any more uh, energy. This is all good, and we can talk about that um, for quite a while. And, and you make the important point in the, in the book as well, that for sustained energy over an extended period of time, the low glycemic options are what's going to uh, probably dial us in the most. And then you also reference to get the most out of your willpower, use it to set aside some time to sleep, um, which we won't go into right now, but just in terms of that energy conservation and, and optimization. The next idea I'd love to hear you describe is pre-commitment. And you use, or you and John use um, Odysseus and his pre-commitment strategy as a way to, to uh, most wisely use our willpower. Can you talk to us about that? Okay. Um, yeah, pre-commitment, uh, th- this is not so much from my work, but this is from other people's work, and it's, 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 it's very good work. Uh, um, it, it's, it's somehow easier or it's often easier to make decisions, uh, not in the heat of the moment. Uh, so, uh, if you decide what you're going to have for dinner early and plan it, you can plan a healthy dinner. Uh, if you wait till that moment, you're more likely to eat junk food, you know, wait till you're hungry and, and, and uh, uh, decide at the last minute. Uh, so planning your meals in advance, especially planning them when you're not starving at the moment, uh, you can make better plans. So that's pre-commitment in the sense that you are committed to a certain strategy. Um, the same with, uh, well, I think much of that is come up with stuff like retirement savings, that if, if you leave it to people each month when they get their check to decide, uh, their, their paycheck to decide how much to put away for retirement, uh, there will usually be something better to do, but if you pre-commit and uh, tell your employer to take out this much every month and put it into a, uh, a bank account or a retirement account or something like that, so you you don't have the temptation when the money comes that oh I'll buy something else with it now. It's 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 already going there. You know, again, it's a pre-commitment in the sense that you decide in advance before you get the money. Uh, that some of it will be put away for retirement or, or, or could be a more proximal goal like buying a house for yourself or saving, put your kids through college or, uh, or whatever. But uh, again, it's easy to do if you make the plan in advance, decide when you're not desperate for money or needing it, when you um, have the, the rational uh, uh, wherewithal to figure out what's best. And you say, okay, well, each month I'm going to set aside this much money uh, over time, that uh, that works. So what that does is spare the load on willpower. Again, this is the kind of thing that people with uh, good self-control do. They set life up to run automatically and smoothly in a way that will get them where they want to go rather than counting on willpower to, uh, okay, I just got paid and I can either go out on the town or I can put it in the bank. Uh, and <laughs> that's a much uh, a dicier um, <laughs> a kind of choice. There's a story from Odysseus as though and he wanted to hear the sirens singing without uh, steering his ship on the wa- onto the rocks. Uh, so he lashed his, uh, he tied himself to the mast and that way he could hear the sounds, uh, this uh, mythical singing, uh, but he wouldn't be able to grab the steering wheel and drive closer, which is uh, in the myth how the other uh, sailors would end up uh, crashing on the rocks and drowning. That's great. And his uh, crew actually plugged their ears, right? Which was an even better strategy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes hear. The uh, crew, uh, they, they couldn't hear it, so they weren't tempted. That's preventing the temptation there. But both, uh, again, they, they w- didn't wait until they were hearing the music and tempted to uh, yeah. go closer and listen to it. The pre-commitment, they made these things before the moment of, of danger. That's great. Um, in your research, what's your favorite, most practical, impactful um, finding you've discovered? Oh, I don't know. I it'd be <laughs> if I had to pick one. I've had the good fortune of working with lots of talented, bright young people, and uh, 
uh, they uh, come up with all sorts of uh, uh, creative and clever things. So it's it's uh, um, it's been a, a a long voyage of many small and interesting discoveries. I, I, there's no way I could pick one. Well, what's, uh, what's, it won't, won't put you under that pressure then. Uh, how about if you're open to sharing anything in your life that you kind of discovered and then it impacted you significantly? Yeah, well, I don't use research to, uh, to study my own problems or issues so much, but, but we do learn from these things. Uh, I think uh, I mentioned a moment ago about the, you know, we learned how much the immune system uses glucose uh, at, at different times, and, and that's one way I've, I've changed. I, I used to make myself just keep working whenever I started getting sick, and if I'd go to the physician, they'd say, oh, you should take it easy and so on, but I'd think, well, I'm not you know, digging ditches out in the hot sun or anything like that. I'm just sitting in a chair or working on my computer. I, uh, I can do that whether I'm sick or not, so I would ignore that, but it really isn't that efficient, and I... I uh, what I realize now is that uh, when you're starting to get sick, your body wants all of its uh, all of its glucose, all of its energy to fight the disease, and so it's it's why you feel tired, and uh, it's a, the best thing to do. And even in terms of work productivity, the most efficient is just to go to bed and sleep around the clock. You know, sometimes I'll sleep for 36 or 48 hours and just get up to uh, watch a little TV or eat or drink something, but uh, let, let your body have all the energy. That's what it wants. <laughs> uh, and, and then and then you get back to work after uh, you know, just two or three days where you get sick. You know, you can be sick for a couple of weeks. And yeah, you know, I used to work through it, but often the work wasn't very good either. I was trying to write a paper or something and I go back and read this. And, well, this is all stupid and it doesn't make sense. <laughs> and then, so it's not very efficient to push yourself to try to do creative work when you're sick because you, because your system really wants all the glucose for that, and uh, and glucose is, is tied into creativity. When uh, people are depleted of their willpower, their their, their creativity uh, goes down in a variety of ways. Hmm. So, um, so that's one thing I've changed. I just uh, when I start to feel sick, I try to cancel everything, and uh, uh, it's like nature's way to telling you you got to sleep for thirty six hours. You can usually tell it's a time when you lie down in bed and. Even in the afternoon, and the bed just feels so good to you. <laughs> um, normally, that doesn't for me. I'm not a you know a sleep in the afternoon kind of person. But if I'm fighting an illness, yeah, you can just tell that that bed feels so welcoming, and that's that's as good a sign as you get that yeah your your system wants you to go to sleep and let it do its job fighting the uh, fighting the illness and get that done, and you can you can fight it off and. Uh, uh, get back to work and play uh, much faster. That's amazing um, and inspiring. As a guy who's, at the time you published this book five years ago, had produced the 450 scientific publications I didn't mention, that was your 28th book. So <laughs> that's fantastic. But using that willpower to uh, rebuild our stores of energy and willpower is fantastic. Um, it, we've obviously not even scratch the surface of all the different research we can talk about um, related to willpower and all your other work. Um, is there anything that we didn't talk about that you feel would be important to highlight? Um, oh, I don't know. I, I, I think your point of, uh, in general, uh, you know, food and sleep, you know, eat reasonably well, and that's hardly surprising advice, but uh, it will help your self-control and mental functioning too. Um, most people are not not really getting quite enough sleep in our, our civilization, at least that's what the experts who track those things say. And yeah, it's a little better if you can uh, get, let your body, uh, it doesn't have to be every night, but uh, um, let, get enough sleep for that. And uh, and it's like a muscle too. I think that's important. Uh, as far as we can tell, if you exercise self-control a little bit now and then, it, it makes the muscle stronger. And when you when you need the strength of character to see you through difficult times, you'll you'll have a little more to fall back on. Hmm. I like the way you point out that when you build willpower in one aspect of your life, it also improves willpower in other aspects. So just as a muscle gets depleted by overuse, it also gets built up over time by continued smart use, right? Right. Well, fantastic, Roy. Thank you so much for taking the time and thank you so much for dedicating your career to doing such important and uh, impactful work. 
Okay, well, Brian, well, thanks for the interview, and uh, have a good weekend. Thank you. Hi, this is Brian. A lot of people don't know all the stuff I do beyond these free videos I share on YouTube, so I thought I'd do a quick video to give you an overview of our membership program that you can get access to and get a ton of other stuff. Uh, so here's a quick look. 10 bucks a month, join the Optimal Living membership program. You get instant access to 250 philosopher's notes on some of the best Optimal Living books out there. Old school classics, positive psychology, modern stuff, mindfulness, peak performance, purpose, neuroscience, wealth, etc. cetera. Um, and what you may not know is that in addition to the PNTV episodes, I create PDFs on all of these great books. So six page PDFs, let's take a look at one of them. Joseph Campbell, you wanna figure out how to live your hero's journey, well this is a great place to start. I basically pull out my favorite big ideas, riff on them, connect them to other books and other ideas and help you apply this wisdom to your life today. That's what the PDF looks like. Again, we have 250 of these on all these different great books. And then I record those PDFs as an MP3. So you can listen to that MP3 while you're on a walk or working out or doing some errands or whatever. Um, that is Philosopher's Notes. Uh, a lot going on there. And then in addition to Philosopher's Notes, you get access to Optimal Living classes, Optimal Living 101. Idea here is that all those great teachers come back to the same big ideas again and again and again. I distill those ideas into classes. Super practical, fun, inspiring classes, ranging from Habits 101, Confidence 101, Getting Stuff Done 101, Meditation 101, instant access to all those classes. And then future classes include Relationships 101, Energy 101, Purpose 101, Business, Goals, etc. Those are our full length classes. And then I create micro classes, two to three to five minute little bursts of wisdom on my favorite great ideas from these great books across the domains that you want to optimize in your life. So we have dozens of these so far. I create 50 new micro classes every month and 10 new philosopher's notes every month for 10 bucks a month. So we're blessed to have thousands of members who are uh, enjoying the program and sharing some incredibly kind words with us. And uh, super simple, 10 bucks a month, cancel any time. Would be honored to be a bigger part of your life. And I appreciate your support. And uh, here's to optimizing and actualizing.